This is the challenge for today, to meet competition and rising costs by moving step by step towards automation, continuous automatic production. Advanced manufacturing is a quickly evolving area that focuses on products from industries like aerospace and medical devices. It requires the latest technology and high levels of design that are considerably more complex than traditional manufacturing, like automaking and steel manufacture. This is The Uncommon Engineer. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. Our guest today on The Uncommon Engineer is Professor Tom Kerfus, professor in the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering here at Georgia Tech, and currently serving as Chief Manufacturing Officer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Welcome to the program, Tom. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. So we're going to talk today about advanced manufacturing and I think a whole bunch of other things around that. You know, we've been hearing a lot about advanced manufacturing in so many different contexts. And so maybe that's the, the best place to start is, could you share your own view of what advanced manufacturing is and a little bit about what you think it will be in the future? Sure. So, you know, advancement, of course, manufacturing to me is about making things. And advanced manufacturing is, is really about what I would say is, is producing high-tech product or producing, uh, you know, maybe even low-tech product, but with very advanced, uh, with very advanced manufacturing capabilities. Um, so I, I noticed in the intro, you even said, well, hey, you know, that, you know, not your traditional manufacturing like automotive, but it turns out, of course, spending a good chunk of time over at BMW, automotive is, is super advanced. You, you go to those assembly facilities uh, and, and you'll see, Lots of robots, lots of AI running around, vision systems, and so forth. So it it really it's just incredibly high tech, and a lot of the same technology is applied over in aerospace. You go to Boeing's facility over in Charleston, where we actually have a lot of work going on, and, and you'll see a lot of these uh, a lot of these different types of capabilities. So manufacturing, really, the advanced manufacturing is is the nexus for automation, controls, materials, sensing. You know, you name it, it's it's all rolled in there. Uh, and, and it's a pretty exciting time because manufacturing is critical to the to the health of the nation's economy, as as we've you know recently seen. And so, it, so maybe we can drill down a little bit into maybe some examples, uh, uh, even before we get to, uh, too too detailed. C can you give some a little more example about, um, let's say, in auto manufacturing? You know, auto manufacturing up until about say five years ago. Um, and now what it looks like today and some of the techniques, some of the engineering principles, some of the advanced uh, data stuff, what kinds of things are you seeing in, in things like auto manufacture? Sure. So I, I think we could, we could take a look at a number of different perspectives, but one actually that really stands out, and I was having a conversation, I started out this morning with a meeting with one of my students at 7 o'clock this morning, and, and she was talking about using AI to detect defects, let's say, in paint or on the surface of, of, a, of a body, if you will. Uh, and you might think about a scratch or a dent and so forth. But even, even a few years ago, five, six, seven years ago, uh, if, you, if you think about the car and then the paint job on a car, you see this, what we would call orange peel. And it really kind of looks like an orange peel. And it was very hard to quantify that. And you actually had experts that would be looking at that orange peel to see if it was acceptable or not. And these were people. And now what we're really doing is now we're, we're training machines. We're actually using AI to take a look at, at finishes like the orange peel, of course, to catch scratches and dents and so forth. But even the orange peel to say whether it's good, you know, it's acceptable or it's not acceptable. And then not only, and, and part of that is, well, now we're gonna be much more consistent than maybe five or 10 or 15 human beings that might be distributed globally you know, across the supply 
uh, um, the actual the production uh, uh, capabilities for, let's say, a, a global company like a General Motors or a Ford or, or BMW. Um, but the other thing is, is now you can actually take the feedback from your AI algorithms, your machine learning algorithms, and feed them back to the robots in the paint shop that are actually painting the car. So you can actually, in real time, uh, close the loop in terms of what you're getting out of your paint systems. And, you know, I, and the things that I keep reading about uh, advanced manufacturing stem everywhere from the large mega scale kinds of, you know, uh, largest pieces of, of, of equipment doing the manufacturing all, all the way down to, you know, micro and nanoscale. And so can you talk a little bit about about that? Is there anything that really connects all of them or is it just so diverse that I'm, I'm kind of looking for common or uh, advanced manufacturing ideas, uh, concepts uh, throughout. Sure. So I, I think we could take several different tacks on that. The first one that I would zero in on is really the digital threat. You know, and, and that is to say, well, gosh, as, as we produce something, uh, you want to be measuring it. You want to make sure that it's produced correctly, and, and then you want to. In fact, what we do is we look at you know making a, a digital passport for a product. Let's say it's a turbine blade that we might send over to our partners at Delta Tech Ops down at the Atlanta airport. Um, when that turbine blade shows up at, at Delta Tech Ops, you want to see it show up with all its production information so that you know that it is, it's a genuine part, uh, that it was produced correctly, and what we call born qualified, or you might also call born certified, so it's ready to go. Um, but you'd like to see the same thing, let's say, for your microprocessor, that your, your Intel microprocessor or TI microprocessor that you're putting in you know, your computer or you know, maybe, your, maybe your remote control drone and so forth. So a lot of digital capability there. And it's not just a, a one-way flow of data coming out with the part, but also we're now tying it into, again, to things like AI uh, type of algorithms where we're analyzing what the control knobs were, what the environmental situation was when we produced it, and what the quality was, what the type of part, you know, its, its capabilities as they came out, and we're learning what the models are. And again, it doesn't matter whether I'm building a ship, uh, you know, and, and grinding well beads on a big ship, or I'm, I'm all the way down to the microprocessor level and, and actually doing a, a wafer fabrication. So all of this links together, uh, and it's on a security basis, it's on a digital information basis, it's on a quality control and a process control basis. I mean, another one, actually, which is a lot of fun, is even just think about 3D printing. You do it layer by layer, which is pretty much how you put together a microprocessor. So lots of cool synergies and similarities. And, and, and of course, those you can start to link together with a lot of your CAD, your computer-aided design or computer-aided manufacturing CAD CAM systems uh, in terms of production operations. So lots of similarities across the board, from big to small to, in fact, gigantic. You know, and Tom, one someone, and maybe this will trigger something, because I think when the, the light bulb that went off in my brain, which is pretty dim at times, the, um, someone okay. described, you know, in a wartime situation where you have an aircraft that's just missing a particular part or a particular part <clears throat> is broken and is sitting on the tarmac for weeks at a time till you get a, you know, a piece of a, 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 right. a very simple replacement part. Whereas if you had the ability to rapidly 3D print or rapidly manufacture it and ship it, you would, the, the cost is almost irrelevant. It's the time. Well, and what's interesting, and, and actually this is, so our colleagues down at, at uh, Warner Robins Air Force Base, just, just south of us, down in, in uh, just, just around the Macon, Georgia area, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things they do, and I find this very interesting, so you've got older aircraft uh, where they may not have the exact design for a part, and, and mm. typically these aren't flight mm -hmm. critical parts, maybe a panel or something, but what I found interesting is they also have plastic machines. Now, the part they need is metal. But, but that does take some time and it's not cheap to do the metal and so forth. So one of the things they do is they may make their first part in plastic, try it out and they find it, oh, that's not quite the right fit and so forth. And so they modify it until they get it right in plastic and then they go over to, over to the metal uh, printer and they actually, you know, they actually produce it along those lines. And that, act, that, that works really quite well. Oh, the other one that I thought was really, really pretty cool is we were talking to a company and they make small appliances. Um, and one of the things they said is they said, well, can you make molds, let's say, for our injection molder? So when we have a new appliance design, we need just molds. And they said, typically, it takes us about 90 days to get the permanent molds. And so making a permanent mold is a little bit harder and heavier duty, you know, and you might want to use the traditional ones. But they said, could you come up with a mold that would last 90 days? 
And so you well, why do you want it to just last 90 days? They said, well, once we finalize the design, instead of waiting 90 days to go into production, we could print out pretty rapidly the, those molds and go into production right away while we're waiting for the, the final molds to come through. I thought that's, that's absolutely brilliant. So now they could be 90 days earlier into the market, which is just, just it's really critical in this particular area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. lots of great capabilities there where you would really merge the two and, and you, you find a very nice marriage between the two, uh, you know, the, the more traditional technologies and, and the newer generation technologies. So, Tom, I know that you wear a couple hats, and uh, at least two, and there's probably many more. Um, you know, in our intro, we described, we mentioned a, a little bit about that you're a professor of mechanical engineering here at Georgia Tech, but you're also currently the chief manufacturing officer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I'm hoping, you, uh, let's let's pick one of them, and to, so you can talk a little bit about, um, let's say, the, the Georgia Tech hat. You know, what kind of research is your is your lab working on? I know that uh, you were a, a major force in the creation of our uh, advanced manufacturing pilot facility uh, off campus. So can you talk a little bit about your work at Georgia Tech and that facility? Sure, yeah, and, and so and it, as you pointed out, it turns out actually the work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the work at Georgia Tech, they're not all that dissimilar. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit of a, of, of a, a, a let's say a, a slightly different than, than the, I, want to, I don't want to say abnormal, right? But sort of, you know, like a little bit of a different uh, 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 bird in terms of faculty member, because we do a lot of, of what I would say are, are a little bit more applied research. Uh, we, we actually go after a lot more hardware and so forth. Um, there's, clearly there's some good fundamental stuff. We've got great PhDs going out. They're going to national labs, they're going to industry, they're going to academia. Uh, but we also work closely with industry. So one of the things that I really have focused on over my career is not just the fun last, fundamental aspect of it, but, but taking those fundamental concepts and helping to scale them and move them forward. And that's exactly what AMPF is all about. AMPF, is, as you've already said, Steve, is the Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility, and, and that we put together with, uh, with our partners, in particular Delta Airlines uh, and, and Boeing. Uh, and, and really, how do we how do we take in that particular facility is really saying, yeah, how do we take some of the benchtop capabilities that we've developed in, in our case at Georgia Tech, uh, and and help to scale them up and get them out into production? Whether let's say it's a, it's a Boeing facility like the Charleston facility where they're assembling the 787 aircraft, or it's Delta Tech Ops where they're doing complete aircraft rebuild and engine rebuild and so forth and sort of working together. And so really, my team. Uh, and, and, and it is, uh, it, it's something that you have to get used to because you're delivering some pretty important technology that these companies are, are now counting on you to deliver. Uh, and it's really the same thing over at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. I mean, our objective, our mantra, if you will, is, is to innovate faster than the competition can copy. And I'm a firm believer in this, and, and you'll see this around uh, now really getting out even into the federal government. And the idea really is, yes, there are uh, competitors that are going to copy, and you can, you know, define competitor as another company, it's another country, and so forth. That's fine, but they're going to copy, and that's just that's just the nature of the business. But the reality is, is if they're copying, but sure, you stay several years out in front, you know, then you know you can very you can very much stay competitive and be very very profitable. Same thing even happens on cybersecurity. It's not about static and building a wall and that's it, I'm done. You know that they're always, the, the, the competition, so to speak, is always innovating and moving forward and you have to stay one step ahead of them. And so really at Oak Ridge, the purview is, is much broader. My objective there is to identify key technologies that are, let's say, in the nascent stage, so in early stages, maybe at universities or in R&D, at the lower technology readiness levels, so bench top, identify those that are critical to advanced manufacturing for the United States, and then work with industrial partners to scale those technologies up to, I would say, about the pilot plant level, so really scaling it up. So it's not all that dissimilar from what we're doing at AMPF. Now, at Oak Ridge, we've got several hundred thousand square feet, and we've got lots of you know, really large pieces of equipment. Uh, at Georgia Tech, it's, it's a little bit smaller, but we're doing the same types of things. In fact, the two fit together really well in terms of designing capabilities, scaling it up, and then really helping to transition it to industry. Sounds like you're working directly with a whole bunch of different companies. And you mentioned Delta as part of the Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility. 
uh, on campus. Can you are you allowed to say a little bit about the kind of work that you're you're doing with them? I mean, it just seems like it's a huge benefit to students to be able to see both sides, the fundamental and theoretical, as well as what might end up in uh, in operations. So, can you share a little more about uh, the, the specific projects um, that that you're working on? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I can I can identify two really nice projects: one on the digital side, and, and then one on the uh, one on the additive side, actually a hybrid side. So I'll, I'll start with the with the digital. So you know, the reality is, it's it's just monitoring of things. So so Delta, I think it was our first project. They came to us and they said they have they have two people and and ha they spend half of their day each half of their day going around to all the lubrication tanks and the coolant tanks and so forth in the machine shop. And this is what the the, the first, you know, your first job at Delta, you know, if you're sort of the, the, the newbie technician, this is what you have to do. It's not the best job in the world, and you got to check the tanks and make sure they're full and the whole bit, and, you know, and so they said, can we develop a, you know, just, just a liquid level monitoring system? And, you know, that wasn't too bad to do, but then it turns out, gosh, well, we've got to hook it into their network system. We've got to store the data, we've got to track the data, we have to make them available, you know, maybe even, you know, on, on our smartphone and so forth. So, so we, we developed that capability, but then we actually developed a lot of the digital infrastructure, uh, including security and so forth, that goes with, uh, with all of that. And of course, it went from just a simple the, the tank level, uh, then we're actually working with another company. Uh, they, were, they were interested in, I think it was GM, they were interested, they said, well, the level thing is cool, can you do temperature? And by the way, you know, most of these things, a little, you know, you get a little box and sensor and processor, maybe an Arduino, maybe a Raspberry Pi, maybe a little, you know, x86 box and so forth. But in general, the most extensive parts of these little sensor boxes, sensor packages, are the box that they go in. Not the sensor, not the processor, not the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and so forth. But, but the bottom line is every time you add a new sensor, it's just another dollar or two dollars. You've got the infrastructure in place. The other thing that was very cool in terms of working with Delta is it initially they said, yeah, we'd like to monitor this and that and so forth. But really what it comes down to is all of a sudden they get it in terms of what the digital architecture looks like. They brought their IT people in. The first thing that happens is, no, no, you can't hook anything up. It's all got to be secure, et cetera, et cetera. But then you work with them because they see the value proposition and, and, and really move it forward. So it starts out with sensors and, and linking them up, and it gets back to How's our process doing? Is it doing the right thing? Are, are we moving things forward and so forth? Which is really nice. So I'm really curious more to hear more about what's happening in advanced manufacturing uh, at the U.S. government level because I, I know that you're you're not you're involved not just at Oak Ridge but helping other government agencies, you know, think about some of these concepts and you know collaborate ac across agencies and of course you know the U.S. government whether it's the military whether it's Department of Energy. Uh, and so many, uh, uh, you know, so many federal agencies support our work. It'd be really great to to understand um, what some of that collaboration might look like, and really how our own government is thinking, uh, you know, more about these advanced technologies. Sure. So, in, in the, you know, what, what's really interesting uh, is is how you know how how we're thinking about these advanced technologies is really. How do you get them into production so that we're, we're comfortable with them? We know what they're doing. I mean, the, the difficulty that we have. And let's just—I'll just pick on a bearing. So I've, I've spent a lot of time in the bearing industry. I mean, let's say like a needle, just a needle that goes in a needle bearing. This thing, you 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 grind it to kind of a few micro inches in accuracy. You produce two per second at you know, pennies, if not less, a piece out of super hard material, it's going to be pretty hard to beat that capability and so forth. So understanding that, bringing it all together, but then also helping not just the big guys. So if you, you've got the big OEMs or the big prime contractors, but here's the deal, and that is that you've got the tier one suppliers, and they're the ones that supply directly to the, to the primes, but then the two, three, four, five, and, and ultimately you get down to what I would call the small, medium-sized enterprise, the mom and pop shop. And the reality is we have got to make sure that they are moving forward as well because you know your, mm -hmm. your, your supply chain, and I do like the word chain there, is only as strong as its weakest link. And so one of the things we're really thinking about is, yeah, how do we move them forward in a secure manner? Um, but also, you know, how, how do we 
get the information in terms of their production operations and processes and, and really leverage that information in a secure fashion throughout the entire supply chain. So again, I'll, I'll give you the example when you're talking 3D printing, you can have two metal 3D printers sitting side by side, all the same settings, all the same material, and the material characteristics of, 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 of the part produced in this machine versus this machine are gonna be different. Uh, and, and why is that? Because there are some slight differences and so forth, and so you really need to understand it and have the models and the control. Well, if I've got some smaller companies that are using these machines, what I'd love to do is get the data from those machines to understand what they're making so we can certify it, but also so we can get better process control. So it's information going up and also information coming back down. Um, you know, so, so these are the things that, that we look at is, is how do we make sure that this technology is securely deployed throughout the supply chain so that we can get what we need and we can get it in a timely fashion. So you don't have that F-18 sitting on the ground because it just doesn't have a part. Um, you know, or, or you know, that, that you, you, you need a respirator. How do you move that one forward? I mean, we're, we're thinking about that. I mean, it's a, this is a great conversation that we've had. So I, I need respirators. Should we stockpile respirators? I don't, I don't like stockpiling respirators because we might not need them for another 20 years. 20 years from now, do you want to, do you want to have some respirator yanked out of storage after 20 years and plugged into you? I, I don't think so, right? And mm -hmm. so really what you'd like to say, well, maybe we can stockpile the components for the respirator. Well, okay, but maybe there are some components that we could do things like injection mold. So maybe we should store the molds for it. And in fact, the reality is, of course, with 3D printing, and this is some of the stuff we've done at Georgia Tech, and we also did it at Oak Ridge, you, you can print up and machine out with a hybrid system, so it's a combination of printing and machining, you can get those molds ready to go pretty rapidly. So now, instead of a stockpile of physical systems, I've got a digital stockpile. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's one of the capabilities you look at. And now I can take my digital designs via simulation and so forth, and I can start to put them together with partners, another partner that we have that we're working closely with is Autodesk. We can put these together, see how they fit together, see if it's gonna be functional, understand what material characteristics we bring together. And then by the way, you turn around, I mean, the stuff we're doing with Autodesk, uh, you know, is, you know, they've got the generative design. So now, you know, again, you're not taking the human out of the loop. The human still puts the design together, but then you say, okay, generative design, why don't you run a bunch of little variations on this thing and, and figure out if there's a better approach to it or a stronger approach or more capable scenario. So just, just tons of things going out there. And a lot of it is, again, linked back into the digital threat. How does the government play a role in helping those small companies, you know, better leverage technology so they aren't the weak link? in the chain. So, so, so yeah, so at, at Oak Ridge, so part of what we do, again, is, is we help to identify key technologies and scale them up so that they're production ready. Um, we'll, we'll do some work in terms of helping out the small, medium-sized enterprises, but really our, our focus, uh, our, we'll, we'll bring in our industry partners. Typically, we'll, they'll have about 80% of the engineering capability to do what they want to do, and we'll supply a very specialized 20% others to, to get it moving along. But then we partner with, with teams. So for example, the different institutes, the Digital Institute in, in Chicago, MXD, or America Makes, the Additive Institute. We partner with them because their, their mission, yes, is to help scale up this technology as well, but they also have great connections, not only to the big primes and, and the large companies, but also the small, medium-sized enterprises. So, so really, we're about partnerships. We provide some of the technical scale-up capability but then we, we, we partner up with our industry partners, with our government partners, uh, par pri you know, public-private partnerships to get it out there. And then, you know, once we've scaled it up, once we've figured it out and we've helped our partners to, to, to get it deployed, then we're on to our, to our next set of, of concerns and, and projects and so forth. So if you, you come out to our facility up here in, 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 in the Knoxville area, in the Oak Ridge area, um, if you come out to our floor, it's, it's a little over 100,000 square feet. You see the equipment there that's there today. If you come in two or three years, that equipment will not be here. We don't. We actually we don't even own the equipment. It's it's on consignment. You know, once once we're done with it, we give it back to our partner company. They'll sell it, and they'll actually bring in the the latest piece of equipment. So we're always working on state of the art technology. But it's it's about scaling it up and and, and getting it out there. That's that's our job over at at uh, the manufacturing demonstration facility. What's our secret sauce in the U.S. in terms of bringing manufacturing jobs? 
back to the U.S. Well, so I, I do think it's it, part of it is going to be to leverage the workforce that we have here in the U.S., which is a highly skilled workforce, and we have to not only make sure that we have a next generation workforce, but we've got to take the current generation workforce and, and move them forward as well. And, and again, I, I think using technologies like smartphone and so forth and, and things that people are comfortable with. You know, my, my mother, she, she's going to be 82 years old. She, um, you know, she, she bought a, a new car recently. She said, well, it's probably my last new car and so forth. So it's sort of a, you know, a little bit sad there because she said, yeah, and after, you know, another five, six, seven years, I might stop driving. And first I said, well, maybe the car will be self-driving at that point in time. But even if it isn't, on your smartphone, you can use Uber. You know how to do that. And, and so it really, it's a game changer. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, think about it. For somebody out in production to leverage this thing, it's got more, way more computing power and memory than what we used to put Neil Armstrong on the moon. So, you know, so I, I think that that's going to be part of it. Part of the, in, you know, is, is really the infrastructure as we start to scale up. I think that the U.S. has seen, I think you could take a look at what's going on with, with the current situation with COVID, um, you know, and, and just, you know, that, that manufacturing is important to the U.S. and it's important to have, I, I don't think you can say, hey, we're going to have everything over here, but I, I think that we need to have a stronger industrial base. Uh, and, and the reality is, I think we can do it. As you start to take a look at next generation machines and chips and so forth, uh, I think you can start building it. We do have a lot of that capability here um, in, in the U.S. And so I, I think the, the opportunities are, are pretty good. Uh, and, you well, know, I mean, even think about Vaccine I mean, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of security and, and digital passport and so forth works well for vaccine production as, as well. So I, I think that there are good opportunities. There are opportunities to deploy new technologies to make things much more efficient. I, I, think, I think things are very bright. And the other thing I will point out is this whole bringing manufacturing back. The U.S. is an enormous manufacturer. So China is the number one manufacturer, but, but the U.S. is by far and away the second uh, largest manufacturing economy in, in the world. So it's already here, and I think it's going to grow, and, and certain things are going to, if you will, come back. But but we, you know, it's not like we're starting from zero. We have a strong manufacturing base here in the U.S. What everyone talks about is, you know, how flat the world is now. And I'm really curious about uh, how advanced manufacturing either, either uh, contributes to a more global you know, manufacturing infrastructure, say for individual products, or does it, or does it separate it? Does does uh, advanced manufacturing, say in India, or advanced manufacturing uh, in in South Korea or China, give them strategic advantages where there isn't a need to manufacture global so globally? So, what in your looking in your crystal ball, where does uh, does it does it help integrate, or does it uh, does it create greater separation between countries? So integrate versus disintegrate, huh? Um, I would say the, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think I think it, it, it does a little bit of both, depending on your perspective. So certainly, as, as I've already mentioned, that you've got, you know, point of assembly manufacturing. So it's, it's very useful that you manufacture a lot of your components close to your assembly plant, because then you don't have to worry about supply chain disruptions and so forth. Uh, so, so that works out well. And, and by the way, the same type of technology and approach that would say, okay, we can have more manufacturing in the U.S. might might go for India, it might go for China, and so forth. So those types of local economies, and, and maybe it might be a little bit more EU centric and United States and so forth. But I mean, I think the nice thing there is, look, manufacturing, just from an economic perspective, is a good thing. And, and so to say, well, hey, we only want to manufacture, we want to manufacture everything here in the U.S. is probably not good for stability in the world. You really want to have some of that spread out. Simultaneously, what I think is very interesting is you take a look at Boeing and, for example, their 787 or Lockheed Martin and their F-35. They've got partner companies from around the world or partner countries and companies from around the world that are making components for those aircraft and they come back to the U.S. for final assembly. And so everybody is really winning out there. And if you look at the digital thread, you know, if, if my... Let's say if, if, if a, a certain part of the fuselage is made over in Japan and then it's shipped over to Charleston for assembly uh, in the 787 facility, uh, it's very nice that the digital passport for that part of the fuselage comes together. And you say, yep, this is good. It'll come together. This is how it all comes together. And you can do this digitally. And now let's say I have a modification to my design. I can modify that design. I can verify it digitally. I can make sure the equipment, in, whether it's Japan or Korea or Germany or wherever it might be, can produce the part and can produce it accurately. We can verify the process. 
then ship it in and have it assemble correctly the first time. So, so I, I think it really works in both directions, and I think it does make the world a better place. It, it really does help us to integrate a little bit more, but it also helps to, in my opinion, really get that, it, it, what we call democratizing advanced manufacturing, getting it out there, and frankly speaking, I think that that really helps keep the middle class strong, which is, to me is a very important thing. For some of our students out there, high school students and junior high students that are listening and our listeners around the world, people know that mechanical engineering is one of the most popular, about the most popular engineering major right now. And you're, uh, you're a mechanical engineering professor. I know you love teaching students, uh, love being in the classroom. I wonder, you know, what, what, are, what are you or what's Georgia Tech doing or how are we educating mechanical engineers today to be ready for the world that the picture that you were painting um, around advanced manufacturing are really preparing them for that dramatically different world? Well, so I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Stephen. I, I think the, the reality is it's, it's a combination. So clearly you have to understand the fundamentals. And when, when those students graduate, um, you know, they're not going to know everything, but, but the hope is that they're going to be able to go out and learn what they need to learn as, as they're going through their career. And that's not just an issue of Googling something and figuring out, oh, this is what Google says or Wikipedia says, but understanding the fundamentals so you can say, yes, this makes sense and I can extend it out and so forth. And that's the, what I would say is kind of the book smart, the fundamental part. But I think there's also something to hands-on education. So you, you've got to have a little bit of a feel for, for building things. I mean, that's what engineers do is, is, is we build things, we make things, we design things. So that when you, you design a mechanism or you design an electromechanical system uh, that, you know, and, and you hand it off to somebody to build, um, that they don't look at it and say, well, I just, I can't, I can't build this because it's, you know, it's just, just outrageous or you've made the tolerances too tight and so forth. So, so the opportunity to go and, and just try and build things and, and move them forward. And so the course I teach is, is ME2110, which is called Creative Decisions in Design. Actually, it's, it's the second year, so the two in 2110 stands for second year. In mechanical, every, every year we have a design and build course where you design something and you go off and build it. Uh, and in 2110, the students are wiring up motors, driving motors, building machines to, to compete against each other. Typically, they're autonomous, uh, they're autonomous machines, um, and they absolutely love it. And in fact, I quite often get in a little bit of trouble because people say, well, you, you do, you're putting too much work on the students. And in fact, we've tried to reduce the load on the students and so forth, but the problem is that the students are having so much fun I mean, I can show you pictures of a Saturday evening where the machine shop is packed. Of course, this is all pre-COVID-19, but the students are packed in there and they're working on the machine tools, building their, their robots and so forth because they're super excited and they're super competitive about it. And this is what, what drives them. And so to me, you know, it's, it's an issue of both hands-on and also fundamental so that you basically say, yeah, I understand what's going on underneath the hood, but I also stand, understand pragmatically how this all comes together. I mean, the thing I really love to do is, you know, I can tell you every student coming out of freshman physics can give you all the equations for riding that bicycle and so forth. But you got to get on the bike and you got to get moving in order for it to work, right? And I actually had one, one uh, I remember one, uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues and his kid said, well, hey, how about if instead of moving when these, he was learning how to ride a bike, instead of you know, moving along, why don't I figure out how to balance first before, you know, I start moving because it'll be safer to balance, you know, in place. But I think if you do the, it, it sounds good, but if you do the analysis, you know you got to have those wheels rotating to help stabilize you, right? And, and so it's a combination of the two things that really makes you a powerful engineer. Well, Tom, it's been really great uh, to spend time with you today. And uh, I can't tell you how grateful we are for everything you're doing for Georgia Tech, for Oak Ridge. Obviously, that's a, that's a special skill uh, to be able to cross all of those different you know, domains, boundaries, and it's incredibly valuable to our, to our students. And we do hear lots of students talk about 2110 you know, as, a, as a tough course, but they remember it and they value it. And I hear them tell stories about that you know, years later. So thanks for everything that you've done in that course and that you've done at Georgia Tech. And um, take care, and we're looking forward to seeing you back on, on campus real soon. Well, great. I look forward to, to, uh, to coming back down to Georgia Tech. And, and by the way, I think if, uh, um, if, if there are any alumni out there, in particular those who have gone through 2110, 
uh, once we get back online and we get everything going again, you know, we're always looking for judges for 2110. You know, feel free to reach out to me or any of the 2110 st staff. You want to come down and judge and show your kids what a, uh, you know, what some real mechanical engineering uh, goes on and get them excited about uh, about uh, Georgia Tech and engineering. Feel free to contact us. All right. Great. Hey, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Tom. Take care. All right. You too.